Hello, welcome to this professional development. We're going to be discussing a few teaching strategies, Marzano style. Before we get there, I want to introduce myself. My name is Tyson Poppleton. My students call me T-Pop in the classroom. I'm a longtime science teacher at Centennial High School, hosted in Circle Pines, Minnesota. I'm currently earning my Master's of Educational Technology at Concordia University in St. Paul. Before we talk about teaching strategies, I have a challenge for you. In order to do this challenge, I first need you to think of a lesson you have to teach. Maybe it's one of your favorite lessons, or maybe it's one you're doing in the next school day. If it's during the summer, you might need to think back or forward for a little bit. The challenge is this. You have a box of popsicle sticks, and you have to incorporate them into your lesson. How would you go about doing that? Now, I know this is going to be different for everybody. Everybody has different content areas. Maybe you're not used to using popsicle sticks, or maybe you are. Regardless, I challenge you. If you're, if you're watching this, take some time right now to pause this video and think of your solution. If you have the opportunity to collaborate with somebody, then I highly recommend that you do that. Find somebody to share your ideas with. All right, pause the video right now. Did you try it? Did you pause the video? I hope you were able to push to generate some awesome ideas. Now we'll get back to those ideas in just a moment. The purpose of this professional development is to learn about Marzano's instructional strategies. Now, who is this Marzano? If you're unaware, Marzano is an educational research and has many published works related to teaching practices, best teaching practices. You can find many of these, these strategies in his book, Classroom Instructions That Work. Now, I'm not going to cover every single one of the strategies from his book. I'm only going to focus on two. The first strategy is dear to my heart as a science teacher, generating and testing hypotheses. Now wait, before you stop and leave, rest assured, I'm not just going to be talking about science class. This applies to all content areas. However, you might recall from science class that we teach students to write hypotheses in the form of if, then, because. Now this format is not a requirement. They're just sentence starters. In fact, you'll find plenty of professional hypotheses in science journals and professional journals that don't use this format. But what a science teachers like most about it, however, is that it splits up the student's critical thinking into three main chunks. The if statement really focuses on a student's pattern making or observations. The then statement allows students to make predictions that come up with solutions and inventions. The because statement is really important. It's where they explain and they provide reasoning behind their predictions and their observations. Now, when students generate hypotheses, they could be using either inductive or deductive reasoning skills. Take a look at these two charts here. Inductive reasoning starts off with some type of a specific observation. And then there's a pattern collection section. Finally, because of those patterns, they form general conclusions. Now, as teachers, we do this all the time. For example, let's say there's a student in your class, Lindsay, who's getting a D minus. That's our specific observation. So we start to come up with patterns. We recognize that maybe she's on her phone during class a little too much. Maybe there is a lack of homework completion, and she seems to be getting distracted by friends. Therefore, we might form a general conclusion. Lindsay's distracted. Now, that may or may not be true. There might be other reasons that Lindsay is, not, is getting a D in the class. But our reason is logical, and that's what's important. Another form of reasoning is deductive reasoning. These are the standard science-y deduction things that we know about. Typically, starting with a general theory, then we form a hypothesis based on that theory, it takes some time to collect and analyze the data, and then we form a very specific collusion based, conclusion based on that test. As a teacher, maybe there is a general theory that computerized tests decrease performance. Now, students who use computers on a test, we hypothesize, will do worse than those that will do it on paper. So what do we do? Well, we collect and analyze some data. Maybe we have students take a test both on paper 
and both on a computer, and we see the results. Now, we form a generalized or a specific conclusion based on that. If the data says that the computers are just as good as the paper test versions, then our specific conclusion is computers do not decrease test performance. Now, generating testing hypotheses, really the purpose of it is to help students with many aspects of critical thinking. It could be asking questions. They might be defining problems, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations, constructing explanations, designing solutions, engaging in argument from evidence, obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. Now, in all honesty, these are all from the next generation of science standards. These are science practices that unify all state science benchmarks. But if you look at this list, these aren't science specific. In fact, can you imagine how might each of these fit with your content area? Well, to help with that, I want to point out that there are many types of hypotheses. One type is a system analysis. This is looking at an overall system and how each part might be manipulated to change that system. They might also be problem solving, trying to figure out what solutions there are to solve a specific problem. There's also historical investigations. This is for you history teachers, trying to figure out what happened and what were the possible reasons why. Maybe they're inventing, they're coming up with some form of invention, like in a music classroom or whatnot. Maybe there's some experimental inquiry. These are the, the classic science investigations. Or there's possibly decision making. Not all of these are science. It's not just science. Here are various examples of each type of hypotheses in action. Now, I try to choose core specific examples that may not easily fit into a hypothesis type. For example, instead of experimental inquiry for science, I chose historical investigations. As a science teacher, maybe I'll have my students describe what the world, how the world would be different today if they didn't know about atoms. And they have to provide historical examples of, as evidence for their reasoning. They have to think about what's going on, that if they have to think about you know, their possible reasons then, and they need to be able to explain it and come up with the reasoning and how they work together. And this is true for any of these types of hypotheses. Maybe for English, they're writing a choose-your-own-adventure style story for a protagonist, and they have to utilize the hero's journey. In physical education, maybe they have to support or disprove an article about how a thousand steps, that daily goal, is built on bad science. And they have to use a hypothesis, their own hypothesis, and collect data. Maybe they're using a heart rate monitor. In music, maybe they have to invent a song lyric to honor a family member. In math, maybe they're changing the variables of the Pythagorean theorem, and they're using spaghetti noodles as manipulatives to vary the side length. Or in history, maybe they have to put themselves in the United States president's shoes during World War II and figure out a different way to cause Japan to surrender without using the atomic bomb. Now, please note that any of these examples and their classifications are very loose. You can easily fit many of these examples into multiple categories. Well, let's go back and revisit the challenge that I gave you before about using popsicle sticks. What did you come up with? Were you problem solving? Were you inventing? Were you decision making? Maybe all of the above. The best part about hypo hypothesis generation is that there's really no correct answers. But students engineer solutions and they come up with specific and general conclusions. Teachers can collect formative data from student work and they can continually encourage growth and the formation of new hypotheses in students. Now, what about the next strategy? Non-linguistic representations is what it is. To make a long story short, non-linguistic representations just encourages the use of all senses when teaching and learning. See, hear, touch, smell, and taste. Now, we're not saying that you need to bring in food for your students or waft perfume throughout the classroom. No, non-linguistic representations have you consider each sense when you are teaching and how students might utilize these senses and variable senses when they are learning. Here are some of the strategies for non-linguistic representation. One of them might be manipulatives. Now think about that. We did the popsicle stick example. 
they might be manipulating them, you know, physically. Maybe they might be creating or doing things with those manipulatives. There's a lot of things going on with the manipulatives beyond popsicle sticks. You could be doing dice, puzzles. They could be playing with cubes or even dry pasta noodles. And they could be creating pictures with those dry pasta noodles. There's also kinesthetic activities. This gets students to get up and move around. They're using their bodies to illustrate a concept. Or they could be singing a song. Pictures are a big part of non-linguistic representation. We can use any form of pictures. We can use charts. We as teachers can use graphic organizers or have students use gra graphic organizers. Or we can even use mental images. Non-linguistic representation in teaching really helps students from all backgrounds, whether that be IEPs, 504s, or helping students learn who might not have English as their primary language. Non-linguistic representation really shines as culturally responsive teaching. Now here are three specific examples that could be used. And just a reminder, it doesn't necessarily have to be these specific classes, and you can use them in a variety of different courses. But science, for example, you can have students stand up and move around to represent the parts of a solar system. You can talk about depth or the distance from each, and they could be rotating around the sun, talking about the Copernican model. In math, maybe they're using paper cutouts to represent fractions. We've seen, the, seen these before, typically when we use the little pizza shapes to represent a quarter or a half. But we can use a whole bunch of different things. We can use spaghetti noodles or beans as well. In English, maybe we have students close their eyes during a read aloud to create a mental image of a book passage. You could do this with a lot of things. Or maybe they're creating a song or writing their own, drawing their own pictures. Now, non-linguistic representations can be teacher-led, but the real power comes from when students implement their own non-linguistic forms of learning as well. Here is a list of some digital tools and apps that can be utilized by both teachers and students. Lucidchart is a great app that allows you to create mind maps and concept webs. You can use the Google Drive suite, including Google Drawings or Google Slides, to create digital drawings. Some of those drawings can even be interactive, such as Google Slides that allow you to go from page to page. Canva is also somewhat interactive, and it includes drawings, and you can create graphic infographics and very cool visuals, both you and students. If you want students or if you want students to create movies or moving images, Microsoft Champ or Microsoft Movie Maker is a great tool to use. If you're using Apple products, you can also use iMovie. Now, what about note taking? Note taking is a great area for non-linguistic representations to shine. In fact, it's great when students use pictures to represent to represent what they're learning instead of just words. Google Keep is a great tool for this. It works with the Google Suite as well if, you're, if your school is part of the Google Apps for Education. Google Keep allows you to create linguistic forms of notes, but it also allows you to create drawings, and it also allows you to take um, audio recordings as well. Evernote is very similar to Google Keep, and it works across platforms, strictly online. These are great tools for students to use. Well, I wanted to end by saying thank you for listening to this professional development. I hope that you come up with your own ways in your classroom to use both generating and forming hypotheses and non-linguistic forms of representation. As a final reminder, get your students to be active, to, to get up and to, to do these things, to generate hypotheses and non-linguistic forms of representation. All right, have a good one.